Welcome to Elevated Businesses, Season 2, Episode 8, where I have conversations with cannabis entrepreneurs. Today, I am thrilled to introduce you to Michael McQueenie, who serves as an attorney for Folly Hogs National Cannabis Practice. Mike has provided trusted counsel to startups and multi-state operators alike on issues associated with legislative, regulatory development, and compliance. Michael has assisted clients in drafting and securing competitive state cannabis permits, having worked on winning applications in multiple states. Michael counsels clients on complex issues of regulatory compliance, including through advising companies on regulatory considerations associated with anticipated mergers and acquisitions. Today, we dive deep into New Jersey applications and those requirements that you must meet to have a winning application. So let's dive right into the conversation. All right, Mike. So thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, You are an expert New Jersey attorney who has worked with, quote me if I'm wrong, like hundreds of applications across the supply chain and have a wealth of knowledge, not only on the licensing front, but also on the operations front. Uh, Before we get started, I would love for you to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started in cannabis. Sure, sure. And and again, thanks thanks for having me. Great to be here again. I think the last time we did this was 2020, maybe right in the middle of the pandemic, right before it or something like that. Right. And New Jersey was certainly stalled at that time. So uh, for myself, again, Mike McQueenie. Uh, I'm an attorney at Foley Hoag. Uh, Foley's an international law firm, uh, very well versed in the cannabis space uh, nationally, both from a regulatory perspective, also a corporate M&A perspective. I sit on the regulatory side of the aisle, so I, I work with clients on licensing, once you get licensed, how to stay licensed, stay in compliance, and then dealing and interacting with the regulator itself. Um, as, as you kind of mentioned on the front end, uh, you know, I think the lion's share of my experience has been here in New Jersey. A uh, great thing about being at Foley is the ability to, to work with clients, scale with clients and work with them in multiple different states. But, but I, I started out my cannabis practice in the state of New Jersey um, a couple of years ago. And, and since then, I've uh, been lucky to work with a number of the uh, already existing licensed operators here in New Jersey. And there's there's still only about a dozen of them who are who are working right who are operational right now. Uh, the the majority or the remainder though are are in progress and and certainly industry is booming from there. Um, I also serve as uh, general counsel to the New Jersey Cannabis Trade Association, which is this, the only association of, of licensed operators here in the state of New Jersey. Um, and then separate apart from that, I teach cannabis law and policy at uh, New York Law School as well. So I like to think I wear uh, many different hats, and and that's always fun in this industry to be able to look at things from so many different vantage points. How I got into the industry, how I got into the marketplace, um, you know, candidly, it, 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 I, I think the, the seed was planted years ago um, when my aunt, my godmother, uh, one of my relatives that I'm closest with, um, she learned that she had ovarian cancer. Uh, she was going through that process. You know, the, the prognosis she had was that lasting five years would make her a survivor. Um, again, extremely close with her. Uh, one of my closest uh, cousins is her son. And, and uh, you know, I think she realized in, in her process that, you know, yes, she wanted to kind of make it as long as she, po- as long as she could for, for her family. Um, but with a lot of the, the medicine and drugs that were being given to her by kind of the medical establishment, she realized that, that she was there, but she wasn't always present, right? So she, mm. she looked at kind of alternative therapies uh, and cannabis being one of them, right? And, and this was before there was a lawful medicinal cannabis program in New York, which is where she lived or in New Jersey for that matter. Um, and, and as I say, as I like to say, you know, one of the most loving criminal conspiracies arose because literally everyone in her neighborhood, whether it was college kids, whether it was retirees, if they could find a way to find a, a little bit of cannabis for my aunt, they would give it to her. And, and sure enough, it, it, it helped her manage her symptoms and, and be there for her family. And, and you know, she, she, she was a survivor under their metrics. She lasted uh, over five years. Um, she wow. did pass shortly after that. But but kind of seeing that firsthand that that this product, which still at the time was stigmatized, could have such a meaningful change, not only in her life, but in the life of everyone she loved as a result, really always stayed with me, right? And so, you know, when I graduated law school uh, in 2012, 
um, I started just as a, as a commercial litigator, right? So, so any kind of business dispute in court, my only goal as a young attorney was, was to be in court, right? And, and, you know, one of the best pieces of advice I got from, uh, from a colleague at that time was whatever you want to do, be annoying about it, right? Like just be out front, you know, start read as much as you can do as much as you can talk as much as you can about it. So eventually people can't, can't deny you can't ignore you. And, and sure enough, early on in my career, I, I got great experience and, and, you know, just being one of those attorneys who could be uh, quick thinking on their feet, problem solving, being able to, to figure things out in the moment. So I, I was able to do that early on in my career. And then I kind of started looking around and saying, well, litigation is fun, but, but oftentimes it's like a war, right? Where you're trying to break right. down the other side. And, and I said, you know, look, it'd be great to try and find something in my career that, that I could help build up, right? Create something, so to speak. And that was around the time that that cannabis legal, uh, legalization in New Jersey was really catching steam. There was a medicinal program, but like many East Coast, Northeastern programs in in, uh, in the mid uh, uh, 2010s, um, you know, it's very restrictive. Right. So all nonprofit organizations, I think at the time in New Jersey, there was only five alternative treatment centers open, mm. uh, I would say probably less than 5,000 total patients. So it wasn't exactly a moneymaker from a legal perspective. And, and even at that time, even though it's, you know, less than 10 years ago, there was still those, those ethical questions for lawyers. Can you counsel clients when you're dealing uh, with right. the, the substance that's federally illegal, but kind of being passionate about it and wanting to constantly learn more. What I started doing was I wasn't going to let the lack of a business opportunity prevent me from trying to figure out how to be the best lawyer in that space. So one of the things I did was I would submit open public records act requests, freedom of information act requests to all these other states that did have more built up programs. And I'd get all these materials back from application materials to regulatory violations and responses from, from attorneys. And, and here I am in New Jersey with, with a, with a very limited cannabis marketplace but I'm one of the few attorneys in the state who has a library of resources and materials to pull, pull from. So by the time, you know, cannabis started getting bigger in New Jersey, um, really 2017 onward, when Governor Murphy starts running for office and says he wants cannabis legalization in the first 100 days, um, I was one of the few kind of boots on the ground that had a working understanding for how to be a lawyer and counsel clients in this space. And then Governor Murphy takes office, surprise, surprise, there's not cannabis uh, legalization within the first hundred days, not even really within his first term, right? So, but but what he did do was he started expanding the medical program. So within six months of taking office, um, uh, he he had another application round that doubled the number of licenses. I was lucky enough to to work with one of the clients who did win to help write portions of their application, um, and it kind of just snowballed from there, right? And and again, just kind of building on this experience every single time. Work with even more clients in the 2019 application round. Lucky enough to, to work with some of the winners there. Um, of course, you know, there was this long lull in New Jersey due to uh, litigation that tied up that 2019 round until 2021, uh, but continued working with clients. And, and you know, uh, eventually the firm I'm currently at, you know, kind of reached out to me and they just and they said, hey, Mike, you know, we understand, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're doing cannabis probably half of your time as an attorney right now. How would you like to do it full time? And how would you like to do it in more states? And sure enough, that was music to my ears. And, and that's when I joined Foley. I love it. How awesome. And how smart too. targeting other states and getting that feedback of like what the previous violations and application deficiencies are. I, that's honestly, I think the first strategy, first time I've heard that strategy from another attorney. So very smart and very proactive. Um, with that being said, the New Jersey market. So right now, as we know, we just went adult use on April 21st of this year, day after 420, which just <laughs> kind of still boggles my mind, but we can dive into that in a little bit. But the ATC, so the alternative treatment centers, uh, when people are looking to get into New Jersey or previously under the medical model, I kind of compare New Jersey medical to Florida medical because they have to be vertically integrated. And essentially you get an ATC license, which means you get the full supply chain and have to develop all of your products. In comparison, the adult use now, you are awarded 
one specific license type, whether retail, manufacturing, transport, uh, or cultivation. What do you see in the market in um, the different types of products that are offered? Like, what do you think those changes are going to be from really changing those different types of models? And how is that going to impact the operators? Yeah, well, so, you know, I mean, this is kind of the funny thing about just going back, you know, just a couple of years ago, right? I mean, when you, when you look at a lot of these governors, especially in the tri-state area, with the exception of Governor Murphy in New Jersey, you know, the original model for all these medical regimes was was the most tightly controlled and restricted medical program in the nation. That, that's what they were all bragging about, right? And vertical integration yeah. uh, in that regard was really kind of like their hedge to say, well, it's going to be limited. It's only going to be these folks and we're going to keep our watchful eye on them, right? And, and you know, a couple of things that came out of that was, was one, yeah, I mean, you can control the supply chain a little bit more from a regulatory perspective. Um, but also, I mean, operate a vertical, it, you know, you're going to need to start with $15 million or more in capital, right? Which is mm -hmm. unachievable, you know, even for successful, for many successful entrepreneurs, right? So one of the big things when New Jersey uh, uh, amended its medical law in 2019 was they said, well, let's chop that up a little bit, right? And let's let's allow these individual license classes. So, you know, look, I mean, I, I, I think um, only time will tell. I mean, we, you know, the, the operators we have right now, we're doing a great job at 12. Um, there's still verticals coming out of that 2019 round. Um, there's four more verticals, um, but then there's uh, 10 standalone cultivation licenses and 30 standalone dispensary licenses. And they're just kind of going through the permitting process right now, the background diligence and the like. But, but yeah, no, look, it's, it's the hope of the regulator here in New Jersey that, you know, with more competition will be you know, competition for consumers, right? And trying to offer mm -hmm. different products to, to, to get people to their stores, get people to their brands. Um, but, but again, I, you know, I think the hardest, the hardest thing for the New Jersey market has been that delay caused by litigation from the last application round, because, you know, look, the, the 12 ATCs valiantly kind of carried a marketplace as it jumped from like 10,000 patients all the way up to 130,000 patients, right? So that's, on its own, it could be a strain on the marketplace, and we haven't heard of that strain. But but new product varieties will be coming, right? I mean, we've you know we've we've uh, in just the last couple of years, obviously the manufactured market has, has kind of picked up speed. Don't have true edibles yet, but we have more on the lozenging side. Co concentrates literally just got approved in the uh, medical marketplace through a regulatory waiver, and and I think you know I I think even just that fact is one of the strengths of the New Jersey marketplace, right? Because my favorite rule that the regulator in the New Jersey marketplace has is, is called the waiver rule, which says, hey, you know, our 100 plus pages of regulations, uh, we can waive any one of those rules if we think it's in the marketplace to do so. And they've done that on several different occasions. So, you know, kind of kudos to the regulator of having, you know, 100 plus pages of regulations, but nevertheless saying, hey, by the way, if you make a good argument, we'll waive them. Can they do that for edibles? Because I was shocked to find adult use, like you can't have edibles in New Jersey right now. It's good. And, I, and I tell you what, even from a lawyer's perspective, it's so tough because you use that, you, you read that rule, right? And it, and it talks about ingestible products and you're like, what's an edible if not an ingestible product? So right. what, what, what they've, what the CRC has consistently said is it requires additional regulation, right? They want, they want the Got Department it. of Health separately to put like their, their food, uh, commercial food kitchen regulation on top of it, which again, for those that practice in, in multiple different states, it's, it's kind of it drives you crazy a little bit. I mean, there are other states that just get around that by putting on the label, this was not produced in a, in a commercial food kitchen, right? Like, you know, it's, so it's, uh, no, I, I would agree with you. And I, and, you know, if I'm a vet man, I would say we probably see that change over the next year. And I, I think we see, you know, I, I think what we're going to see in this market, especially for the next year and a half is, um, products like new product varieties will first be available in the medical marketplace almost as a testing ground the proving ground but also to say that the patients deserve the, the first crack at these at these great new products yeah and i think that's what we'll see over the next couple of months and, and one thing we heard from the regulator when they testified in front of the new jersey senate last week was you know they're, they're going to finalize their adult use regulations which they're required to do by the end of the summer then they're going to turn back to the medical and i wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of those kind of revolutionary new ideas come through the medical I hope so, because that was one that stumped me. Um, some of the clients that I'm working with in New Jersey are from other states, 
California, Michigan, Colorado. And so, um, and especially in the retail space, they're from a business development standpoint, they're trying to figure out what the lay of the land's going to look like within their retail space. And so I've actually been advising for you to receive your first license, you might want a smaller square foot in your retail facility, because we won't have so much diverse products, like especially with this edible situation, um, at least from what I've seen in Florida. And again, I like to compare New Jersey to Florida just because of the ATC vertical model. A lot of times, as we know, it's a handful of multi-state operators or MSOs that are the ones that have the funding able to actually do this vertical integration model. And so they are exactly required to innovate and like create new products because they already have a foothold in the market compared to something like California or Michigan, where California, as we know, they've been doing this for three decades. And so they have a ton of unique products, a ton of innovation, and you just don't have as many SKUs in your retail storefront. So if you have this massive retail storefront and only have like 15 to 25 SKUs, you have all this dead space. And so that has been a really big challenge for me personally, advising my clients to help them in their business strategy and what type of facilities they should be going after. Um, I I really hope that New Jersey does start to expand, especially the edibles. I mean, the edibles, they asked me that question probably like two months ago and I did not have an answer for them. And then I finally got the answer probably like three weeks ago. And I was just like, there's no edibles. I can't believe this. But, and, <laughs> like, and, and on that point though, I mean, the, the one thing I will say, like, and, and don't get me wrong, like our, our, the regulator here in New Jersey is great. And, and the executive director in particular, he's been out, he's been around the block a lot, you know, big concern is obviously safety. And like, as I always say, like never overlook the fact that in a new market, even regulators are doing this for the first time. And don't get me wrong, like right. the, the majority of these regulators now are part of like CANRA among other organizations where they can have that dialogue with other out of state um, regulators to, to kind of get to that consensus on safety. Um, but, but, you know, don't, you know, I, what I would say is don't take a prohibition in the rules um, as gospel. What do I mean by that? What I mean, what I mean by that is you can always make the argument, right? Like, and this is about like, and I, and I actually think we talked about this on our last podcast two years ago, which is knowing the regulations um, is just as important as knowing the regulator. And what I mean by that is like, what motivates them? So if you're just going to make an argument that we want an expansion or a waiver or whatever it is, know what motivates them from a concern standpoint. Otherwise, your message is going to land. I mean, you know, if you tune into these CRC meetings, you hear people all the time saying, I want edibles, I want edibles, I want edibles. But how do you make the argument that that actually, no matter what your concern is, whether it is from a food grade kitchen regulation standpoint, whether it is from a stability testing standpoint, like all of these things, just understand whenever you make that argument, you got to bring you got to bring um, all your support to the table and understand the audience that you're pitching that to. So so again, this is a moving market. Our adult use regs will change by the end of the summer. Our medical oh, regulations yeah. will change probably in the last quarter of, of 2022. So it's a time for really good arguments. And that's where folks from out of state can have a leg up because they can at least bring this vantage point of, of these were the hurdles we, we experienced when we brought this into the new into a, a, a Western market in the first instance. And here's how we got to yes, here's how we got to safety. Yeah, absolutely. And as we know from other markets, regulations, the first three to four years, like they're, they change so drastically. I mean, California, Michigan, Colorado, Colorado. I remember we went through probably, I want to say four different sets of packaging and la just packaging and labeling within the first few years, which as we know, that can be extremely expensive because usually they're ordering their inventory labels in bulk and things like that. So uh, nothing new in new markets. Um, we just got to keep on rolling with the punches. But on the licensing front with New Jersey adult use, uh, one thing that I really love that New Jersey is doing is their grading structure or who gets their application evaluated mm -hmm. first based off of, you know, uh, low impact uh, economic zones, social equity, women owned, all of those different types of things. I really feel that them and New York really are trying to put this social equity first and make sure that the people that have been impacted by the drug war 
do have a leg to stand on and have a seat at the table. Um, so with that licensing process, do you mind unpacking a little bit of what that looks like? What is the difference between a conditional license and an annual license? Oh yeah, and, and this is one of those things, it's like, <clears throat> you know, when you when you practice in depth in some of these markets, it's, it, it's, it's like singing your hits, right? I just feel like I go through this every single day. Um, yeah. But but you're right. I mean, New, New Jersey's been really unique at how they approach this, right? And and it's so funny. So many of these states like have the headline grabbing numbers that that often come from their statute, right? Like New York, it was big when the MRTA came out, and it was 50% of all licenses are designed to go towards social equity applicants, right? And and New Jersey, in contrast, on the face of the statute, said you know it was it was a uh, 15% for um, uh, minority-owned businesses and then, a, and then a mix of 15% for women-owned and veteran-owned businesses, right? And, and the question is, well, how does that actually end up playing out in licensing? Now, um, in the adult use notice of applications that, that folks are applying under right now, uh, it, it took a unique turn in the sense of saying, you know, basically 100% of the conditional licenses that have been issued to this point, and there'll be more conditionals issued on Tuesday, 100% of those are either social equity uh, or diversely owned. I don't even think they've gotten to impact zones yet, right? So like, it's this wow. distinction between a statutory goal versus regulatory implementation. And and so, you know, how this ends up breaking down the licensing process, it's important to understand first the conditional and then the priority, right? So so the biggest distinction, and, and to take one step back, there's ba there, there are basically 10 buckets of priority, right? Uh, you can fall into one of these 10 buckets. And where it becomes most relevant, the easiest way to kind of paint this picture is bucket number one is social equity conditional license. Bucket number 10 is your is your classic MSO. Um, and and how this plays out from a from a application standpoint is even if the MSO submitted their application on the first day possible, if they submitted their cultivation application on December 15th at 9 a.m that application can get jumped basically indefinitely by any uh, conditional social equity, by any conditional diversely owned, by any conditional. So, so again, like, it, you know, it, it's, it's the way that this system is designed is to continue to prioritize those who are kind of non MSOs in favor of these other buckets of priority to make sure that those getting to the front of the line first are these other license class or are these other um, groups that, either the statute or the regulations seek to prioritize, right? So, so that's one through 10. One through five and six through 10 in terms of buckets of priority are the same. The, the main difference being one through five are conditional licenses, right? And what's a conditional license? So a conditional license, the first gating item on a conditional license is all of the owners, right? So anyone holding 5% or more in the company, needs to have made in the last tax year less than two hundred thousand dollars if they if they file their tax return on their own or if they're married filing jointly less than four hundred thousand dollars right and and kind of the thought the concept of this is that if you make uh, uh, under those thresholds you know you're you're not rich right like you're 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 lower income and, and again the irony of all this is like only in the state of new jersey is someone who makes one hundred ninety nine thousand dollars a year considered lower income, right? And that, that's what right. I really find, find <laughs> interesting, right? But that that that's what essentially qualifies you as a conditional license holder. Now, what is a conditional license? A conditional license, once you win it, doesn't give you the ability to grow cannabis, process cannabis, or retail cannabis, right? Um, what it does is it, it, um, it, it basically gives you like, a temporary right, right? And, and, and you have 165 days thereafter to file your conversion application, which is basically the annual application, what you would think of as a more fulsome cannabis application. And so, so why does it matter? Why does it make sense? Why it matters on the, on, the, on the front end is, again, if you're a conditional license holder, you're in buckets one through five of priority. Now, the other good thing is once you get your conditional license and you go to do your conditional conversion, you reapply at your same priority. Right. So if you were a social equity owned um, cultivator and you, you would be applying as a one B applicant, when you go to when you go to submit your conditional conversion, you submit it as a one C. Right. So no matter what you can, it's, it's this whole theory and this whole concept of continuing to jump the line. 
<clears throat> and, and again, the, the rationale of the CRC and the legislature says, well, if we give someone a conditional license, it'll let uh, potential investors, uh, it'll let municipalities know that this group is serious and at least has the first step in this licensing process. So that was the idea, to, to give an individual applicant something more than nothing um, in order to be able to go out to the marketplace and get those kind of missing ingredients of the application, right? So, so again, those first five are conditional. So the, the first bucket within that first five is social equity. Those are folks who, who have classic cannabis convictions um, or, or, or come from these areas, disproportionately impacted areas and make another income threshold, basically less than 67,000. Diversely owned is kind of what you would think of as your classic social equity, right? Like certified women owned business, certified minority owned businesses. Then there's impact zone businesses, which are statutory listed cities. Then there's the bonus points criteria, which is essentially if you do stuff with unions and then there's just condition, then there's just regular conditional. Then you go six through 10 and it's the same repeating factor. Um, except you just don't have the conditional threshold to it. Now, what makes this whole process interesting is, um, you know, and, and understanding kind of where New Jersey is today, it's also important to kind of like have a sense of what the, especially the last two application rounds look like in New Jersey, right? So it was a 2018 application round, which was just for the verticals, 2019 application round, which was for a couple of verticals and some of these other medical licenses. But those two rounds were what I would call like, your classic East Coast competitive beauty contest type of applications, right? Where, you know, really kind of yeah. tailor made for the incumbent industry, right? Like the bigger established operators um, who are then bringing kind of, you know, everyone of importance within the town or the state of importance and bringing them onto the advisory boards and, you know, doing community host agreements and, and promising to work with these charities and that charities, right? So, but but really built for incumbents. The other thing that happened with both those application rounds, right, which was the inevitable 2019 lawsuit, which stopped the program in its tracks for two years, right? So I, I think as, wow. as the CRC and the legislature started looking at the industry as a move on a move, move forward basis, they said, well, you know, we know that if we continue to do these competitive applications, two things are going to happen. One, we're, gonna, we're always going to be sued, right? Because if we're the ones picking winners or losers, um, they're always going to sue us saying we favor this person over that person and the like. The other thing that the CRCC said is, is, you know, I think, I think candidly, I think they said, well, why are we in the best position to say who the limited few license holders should be? Shouldn't that be the marketplace's decision at the end of the day? Right? So the correction that occurred in the adult use round was they, or in the, in the current application round was they said, look, don't get me wrong. We want to know that everyone is compliant and understands our regulations on the front end, right? We want to understand that they know what safety and security looks like, what adverse event reporting looks like, what waste disposal looks like, what um, you know, what 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 it takes to have an operations plan or a cultivation plan or a dispensary. We want to know those things, but we we, we don't just want to give licenses licenses to those who know those things and then and then are are, are putting the uh, the lipstick on it, so to speak, right? So, so that's what they did at the state level. Now, the only other thing they did uh, in the adult use round that they didn't do on the, me on the medical side was um, they said that having a local municipal approval was also required. And, and whereas in 2018, 2019, you needed, a, you needed local support, but, but you could get it in the form of like a letter from the mayor, a letter from a town council person, a letter from a business administrator, because it was a little bit more loosey-goosey in terms of what you'd accept from the local level. Now, where that's changed substantially is uh, when adult use was implemented, much like in other states, the statute said all municipalities in the state of New Jersey have to either opt in or opt out by August 21st, 2021. Vast majority opted out, right? So, I, so despite the fact that 70% of New Jerseyans voted in favor of it, 70% of towns ended up opting out of those uses, which is like crazy and remarkable. And, and, and I work with clients goodness. in some towns where the, the, the town base of its citizens voted 80% in favor of the adult use law and the town was still going to opt out, right? So like a little bit of this learning curve from towns of, of still being afraid of it, notwithstanding the fact that the people are for it. Um, so the other thing they did though was they said, it, to evidence local approval and support, you need a resolution from the governing body, right? So your entire town council has to vote in favor of your application and your location, right? 
Now, the other big thing that towns did in opting in or opting out is they said that they could they could set caps on how many licenses they wanted in their town, right? So the vast majority of towns are not unlimited. So there's a lot of towns who don't even allow retail or don't allow cultivation. And of those towns that allow some of these uses, they'll say, well, we, don't, we only want one dispensary or two dispensaries or one cultivation or two cultivations, right? So the big fight in New Jersey has been finding not only properties, but towns that'll give you approval and, and more than that, towns that haven't already hit or exceeded their cap, right? So in many respects, mm -hmm. the state has made the state license not easy, but easier than the, than the beauty contest while kind of punting the, the decision on who's winners or who's losers down to whether or not you can find a town that, that'll give you that local approval. And that's been the big fight, right? And, and, I, and I think it's kind of right. like an unintended consequence in the sense that, as we talked about, the state wants to prioritize these folks, especially those who, who, who aren't the millionaires, who don't make you know, the top salaries in the state. Meanwhile, they've created a, a two system process where you have to spend money on your state application and separately and more and it's increasingly the case you need to spend a lot of money on a local application first right because many towns have said well if we only allow one or two licenses we should create a local application process maybe that's similar to the state application process so we can try and figure out who to pick and choose right and so and, and that's kind of been the really remarkable turn which is you know again i think all of this was kind of well-intentioned and a way to let more people into the industry beyond just incumbents um but nevertheless it's it's kind of created this these multiple ripple effects of complexity um and that that are still playing out and like and like and i'll give you i'll give you a perfect example there there's a great client that i've been working with for years who have just been waiting for uh for an application round especially while that medical round was tied up in litigation woman-owned business uh self-financed um two great people and individuals they had a town that they were focused on they worked with that town for months they appeared at town council meetings they 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 met with people in the community they listened to their concerns and sure enough when that town opted into adult use um uh, they were one of the first uh, uh businesses in the state of new jersey to get a local approval sure enough what happened they've already been brought into one lawsuit and 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 they were lucky enough to win that law, so the judge recognized that the judge recognized okay. that everything the town did was proper, but not being threatened with a second lawsuit, right? And and so it's just this whole thing, right? And and again, I I think as I said earlier, I think one of the goals of the state was was to try and avoid lawsuits, right? Um, but the reality is, no matter where you kind of push or shift responsibility for the ultimate determination of who wins or loses a license, it's inevitably going to result in, in lawsuits. So you know, as I always say to folks, the only sure things in life yeah. are you know, death taxes and cannabis lawsuits. And, and unfortunately, we're still seeing those lawsuits play out. And I think more, more will be coming down the pipe. My goodness. And it's just everything that's happening with New Jersey at the local level is very similar to California as well. It's like deja vu all over again in another state. And uh, one thing that I heard, I didn't exactly experience this directly with any of my clients, but what I heard was at the local level, let's say that municipality says, I'm going to allow for two retail storefronts. And they're only allowed to give approval to two retail storefronts. They can't give approval to, let's say, 10 retail storefronts and then wait it out at the state level to see who gets licensed first at the state level, which I thought was like, I mean, I guess that is opening you up, yourself up for lawsuits if you do do the latter. And But I was just like, wow, like what happens if you do give approval and then they don't pass their state application at first, they have a deficiency and then they have to go back through like all of it is just so complicated. So with that being said, the licensing deficiencies, what are the most common mistakes that you're seeing and, and by right the, now? Just to your last point real quick before I get to that one. hundred. Well, so yeah. what you said is absolutely true, that, that a town should not be giving more resolutions than they have licenses available. Not every town knew that or understood that, right? So like, you know, oh just, goodness. I mean, again, when now we're in kind of like the, sec, the, the second incantation of licensing, we're on the retail side. Cultivation and manufacturing opened up in December 15th. A lot of these towns only passed their local ordinances, uh, um, you know, August 21st or around that time, right? And everyone was still figuring out 
So there were some towns that gave out more resolutions than they, than they had available licenses under the cap, which going back to, you know, this priority structure made it so hypercritical to say, well, you know, can I structure my business in a way that gets me to a higher priority? Um, or what does that mean for right. my, for, for the other competition in this town? And, and really like for, for the first several months of legalization and the build up to, to licensing, it created all these strategies of trying to figure out, you know, again, how not to lose your investment, right? Like you've, you've sunk these resources in the state application. You've sunk these resources into a, into a local process and everyone's feeling it out and figuring it out for the first time, which gets back to, to your question on, on the deficiencies, right? Um, and, and, you know, deficiencies, you know, is, is like this is the stick in your spokes as you're trying to get to licensure, because at the very least, even for conditional to get to conditional license licensure, assuming no deficiencies, it takes 90 to 120 days just to get to that point. Now, the CRC has a huge, you know, bundle of applicants. I think as of last week, there's, there's been 900 total applications submitted across all classes, wow. right? Um, and they're doing their best to really move through these piles and you give them credit because, you know, I mean, I, I think over the first four months, they did issue about 101 licenses, conditional licenses, right? So smaller application packet, but nevertheless. Um, but I think one of the other ways, candidly, that they've, they've tried to manage the pile, so to speak, is, is to use the deficiency process, right? So, so in New Jersey, there, there's, there's a three phase uh, review process, right? The first review is on priority status, right? So, so um, you know, they pick up your application. I mean, it's in the portal, but but they're picking up the application and they they say, okay, well, you self-designated in the portal as a social equity business. Let me see what you've submitted to prove to me that you're a social equity business. And I should add, the whole social equity process has been confusing for a lot of folks who haven't kind of triangulated what the requirements are, right? Because if you're going off of a cannabis conviction. One of the kind of like unfortunate catch 22s about cannabis arrests and cannabis convictions, especially as they relate to licensure, is if you've been arrested over the probably the last 15 to 20 years for anything cannabis related, more often than not, a lot of these states, instead of convicting you, put you through what, what we call in New Jersey like a pretrial intervention program where they say, we're going to stay your charges, we're going to stay your conviction. As long as you go through either drug court or do community service or, or something like that, as long as you go through what we're telling you to go through, we'll wipe away that conviction, right? And and like what's unfortunate about that is it doesn't take away the trauma of the underlying arrest or going mm -hmm. through the criminal justice program. So I've had so many people come to me and say, um, you know, we're building on our team. We have a trust partner who has a cannabis related conviction. And I, and I always say, I go, I say, look, you know, this isn't to give anyone a hard time, but you got to ask the questions. Can you present to me the paperwork of your conviction itself? And more often than not, when they press their colleagues on that, it, it more often than not, it comes out that it was a pretrial intervention, not an actual conviction, right? And so that's something that at the priority stage, if that were the case with the documents submitted, the CRC would, would, would punt it back to you and say, this is an adequate proof. If you have something else, upload. If not, you know, your options are kind of to withdraw your application submit again and then again get get behind whatever your priority bucket is same thing with diversely owned right i mean for diversely owned businesses um it's 51 percent owned and controlled by either a minority or a woman or in the case of a veteran-owned business a, a, a disabled veteran right now it's not just having that right you have to get the certification from the department of treasury that actually certifies you as that so a lot of folks will just upload their operating agreement and say i'm 51 percent owned and controlled um, by females, right? And you'll get a deficiency letter on that saying, hey, you know, give me your certification. If you don't have it and you can't get it, they're going to have to reject your application. You go back to the end of the line. Um, and that certification can take weeks yeah. to get to, right? <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and to the Department of Treasury's credit, they recognize how competitive the application process is in New Jersey. And, okay. and they do their best, you know, within their abilities to expedite the review of those. But yes, you know, if you call up Treasury today and, and ask for an estimate, uh, you know, the, the, they'll tell you it takes four to six weeks to, re to review those applications, right? So it's difficult. Wow. Um, so that's your first level review, which is just looking at priority. Now you've gotten to f through first level review. Now you're on second level of review. Have you, re have you submitted all mandatory documents required, right? 
Um, so like if you're looking, if you're doing a, um, a conditional license, right? For all of your persons of interest, in, a, in addition to the, uh, I think it's like a 16 page uh, uh, personal history disclosure form, have you submitted all those? For all your persons of interest, did they give their last year's tax returns? And not just their last year's tax returns, but their last year's state and federal tax returns, right? So I, I, I see a common deficiency that people get hit with um, when they've uploaded the federal, but they haven't uploaded um, their state tax return as well, right? I, the, the, the worst, the most egregious deficiency that, that, that I've seen, and, and, and I just so, I feel so bad for the applicant, um, is on government issued IDs, right? So you have to you have to provide government issued IDs for all persons of interest. I knew somebody who uh, had a government issued ID. They submitted their application on December fifteenth. The reviewer did not review their application until let's call it February first. On January twenty eighth, their IDs that they submitted on December fifteenth expired. They got a deficiency letter saying uh, you need to update a current government issued ID, uh, not an expired one. And note, after you submit your application, you can't change it, right? So like completely out of the out of, out of the uh, applicant's control, like they, you know, there's nothing they can do to change that, right? Um, but it's just kind of a oh sampling goodness. that you know, you know, you never know what reviewer you're going to get. Um, but it's important to kind of like know mm -hmm. the types of things that come come out and 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 see what can come up from that. But but again, the mandatory documents thing, I think is the most difficult because as most practitioners will tell you, the disclosure requirements for New Jersey, especially on the front end of an application, may be the most onerous nationally. And, and, and this becomes difficult, especially for applicants who, um, who are soliciting funding with lenders, right? Because it's one thing for a lender to say, hey, look, I'm gonna commit to give you whatever it is, uh, $2 million, uh, once you get your final license that um, that you you know that I'm going to give it to you under a loan and 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 that's great and and you're so lucky because access to capital is the most difficult thing in the in the industry you're so lucky to get that and then the applicant comes back to the lender and says hey by the way um, I need uh, your entity that's lending this to me to to fill out this 38 page entity disclosure form. I need all of the owners of your lending vehicle to complete these personal history disclosure forms that also requires those owners um, to give us your tax returns, both state and federal, and all this other information. And, and if you're a lender who's unaccustomed to New Jersey, you look around saying, you're running me through the ringer when I'm the one giving you $2 million, right? So it's like, it's, it's, right. it's and, and again, we're just at completeness review. We're, we haven't even gotten to, on the documents, we haven't even gotten to the substantive review. And, that, and that's, and that's the third bucket of application review, which is have you uploaded all of the the other required documents, right? Which, which is, you know, have have you uploaded your regulatory compliance plan, your business plan, your plan to obtain liability insurance, and and then anything else you check in the portal, right? Like so, New Jersey is a portal-based application, right? Uh, you know, and it's relatively speaking user-friendly, although it's got a lot of bugs to it. One page is a is a list of I, I think it's 15 to 20 questions that are you check either yes or you check no right, and I always call that like the unintended consequence list right because there's questions in there such as do you intend uh, to enter into a, a partnership uh, with a reentry program, and I would tell you 99% of applicants say that's a good cause for me to get involved in you know what I do intend on entering into a reentry program once I'm licensed I check yes. Now, if you don't have a partnership with a reentry program that you already have on paper that you've uploaded into the documents pane, that's another area that could get flagged as a deficiency for you, right? So it's just like all these learning yep. curves, uh, you know, all <laughs> these methods to kind of handle the pile, all these potential hurdles. And again, every time you hit a you hit a deficiency, you're then paused where you are in the process, and anyone else who's ahead of you continues to jump you, right? So it's just like. This is, and, and, and candidly, that's the hardest part to kind of communicate with clients. It's just like, it's, you know, it's like the guy who's like juggling plates, right? I mean, that that's how the New Jersey application process works. And it's, uh, you know, in a process where folks are spending money, where you're kind of looking for as much predictability as, as possible, you know, candidly, the best that you can do is just, you know, work with professionals who kind of understand the typical issues and pitfalls that go into this and work with you so that before you submit that, you know, click that submit button, 
you know, you're never going to have a hundred percent confidence, but as close as you can get to a hundred percent, you know, that's going to help you sleep at night. Right. Yeah. Speaking of, I did not sleep at night when I submitted those applications. It's nerve wracking. The anxiety from all of it. The uh, I was super happy with the portal. I felt like it was pretty user friendly compared to some other sites that I have experienced. So I was happy to see that. And uh, also, thank you so much for the heads up, too, because you told me you're like, hey, it took me all day to get like two, three applications in, like, make sure you go in, play around, do the technical training Which, and stuff and I, like that. So and, and I tell you thank what, you for uh, that heads up. You know, but like <laughs> December 15th was like, because that was the first, you know, I was th through so many of these things, I always say it's like the first time for everyone, right? But that's what made December 15th. So yeah. anxiety written, because, you know, I mean, one thing for December 15th that doesn't exist anymore is they made the portal live for folks in the days leading up to that application, right? That opened on December 15th. Mm. And let me, let me take another step back and say like, you know, you want to go into an application feeling like you have everything together and ready to go. They didn't make the 38 page entity disclosure form available until the Friday before that December 15th. And, and, and all Ooh, the, all talk about working weekends. <laughs> then the other thing that New Jersey did, and this isn't this isn't to rag on them, you know, a lot of friends. Are there, but, but the other thing they did was <laughs> they made the portal live live in the days leading up to December fifteenth, right? So folks started uploading documents and saying, okay, well, I know I need to put this document here. I I know I need to fill out this information there, and they did that in the days leading up. And they said, oh, I'm diligent, you know, I'm I'm ahead of the curve. I, I triple checked it to make sure I'm not giving the CRC issues on the back end. Sure enough, the morning of December 15th comes wiped clean, uh, absolutely wiped clean for anyone who is diligent is. enough to do it that way. Um, and, and again, it's just, you know, all those moving parts and everything that went into it. And again, it's, it's easier and better now in the sense that for everyone who submitted in the retail round, which opened up on March 15th, the portal was live. They had the benefit of at least some deficiency letters at that point. There was the learning curve, but but again, being in that first wave of it, much like you, it was like anxiety for even two weeks afterwards, just like every all the permutations running through your head. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Just like second guessing yourself at every step. Did I do that, dude? I like that so many times I went back into the portal to like triple check different things. I listened to you on a webinar and I was like, oh, those are the deficiencies. I need to go check and like triple well, check. And I did the some way, of these though, things. Like, you like, know, and, and <laughs> you know, when I was in law school, they always used to say no, no postmortems, meaning when you walk out of an exam, don't go talking to a friend of yours because they're going to say, Oh, hey, by the way, how about that uh, that that uh, one question um, about about this specific area of the law? And you're like, you're like, I didn't even know that's that's what they were asking about. And then your anxiety written for months afterwards. The one thing I'll say that that I think is of, of value to folks is um, don't be afraid of going through that exercise that you just said. Which is, I've had folks come to me after the fact and they say they say, Mike, I don't I don't know what to do with the in between time. Can you go into the portal? and flag for me what you think could be deficiencies, right? And there's some anxiety to that because once you do that, you know that you're probably gonna get hit with a deficiency letter. But what I tell folks is, one, I'm gonna be more onerous on my review than hopefully the CRC is. But two, I think I'm gonna be able to identify the majority of deficiencies that, that they could potentially go after you with. So what you can do then is, you can just set up on your desktop a file that says anticipated deficiencies, right? If you're missing documents, other information, such that when you get that deficiency letter, your first move is to read the deficiency letter, understand that it's probably, if not the same, less than what we flagged for you, and then immediately be able to go in and upload what was missing, right? Because in New Jersey, it's all about time, yeah. right? So you want to make sure you don't lose too much time and have people jump you in the process, right? So, so that's where I think it's still valuable to do that postmortem that we didn't want to do in law school, because at least then you're going to be primed that when you get that deficiency letter, it's not a three-day process or a two-week process. It's probably a within-the-hour process. And, and again, timing is everything in New Jersey. 
Yeah, smart. Very smart. So to any of our listeners that uh, want to get into New Jersey to recap this conversation, high level, uh, one, your local level is going to be the biggest challenge, uh, not only finding a facility, but also hitting all those requirements to make sure that you are truly approved at the local level with the municipality. Uh, number two, you have the conditional first annual application uh, workflow. So the conditional will be reviewed first above the annual, but you also want to make sure that you get into those high priority buckets. And what else? Am I missing anything I, I, else? With, with New Jersey, we're always missing something else, but I think we got, I think we got the high, you know, it's document <laughs> heavy, anticipate deficiencies, always work on the local level and, and, you know, always budget that it's going to take a little bit longer than you anticipated. But the only way to make it the only way to make it long as opposed to super long is to make sure that you're constantly buttoning everything up and, and making sure that of the million documents they request, you at least have uh, you know the vast majority of them. Yes, absolutely. And so with that being said, when do you think like new retailers will open up their storefronts uh, that are not ATCs? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a good question. I mean, if, if I'm a betting man, I think it's going to be, to your point, I think it's going to be the, the medical dispensary onlys that get open ahead of any of the adult use retailers. But, you know, look, playing it out um, for the folks who submitted on March 15th, uh, Conditionals are always going to be prioritized first, right? And again, the, the catch-22 with conditionals is they then have to submit a, a, a annual conversion, which means they're going to be back in the queue, right? So, you know, I, I, I would guess that, you know, new non-ATC, expanded ATC dispensaries um, probably won't be open until 2023. Um, it's the good news, good news, bad news with New Jersey, right? The good news is they're expanding um, the ability for you know, uh, for folks who traditionally wouldn't have the first access, right? But the downside of that is um, it's going to delay those licenses getting getting open, right? Because it's that two-step process mm -hmm. review, no matter what, at the, at the quickest turnaround is 90 days. So for conditionals, that's going to be 90 days times two. Um, so I, it'll it'll be some time, unfortunately. It'll it'll probably be well into 2023. Yeah, I agree. That was kind of my thought process too. Like Q1 2023, if it all goes smoothly, depending on the review process and everything else. And it was interesting, specifically on LinkedIn on April 21st, first day of adult use sales for New Jersey. I saw a lot of posts about people being frustrated that the MSOs were like the first ones to market in New Jersey on the adult use side. And me being the firecracker that I am would like respond back and be like, well, if you actually read the regulations then you would know that that was actually the intent, like, yes, they had this really great intention with all these different buckets and review process. But really, if you read the regulations, you knew that the previous MSOs with the ATCs were going to be the yeah, ones like, that were first to market. And again, like, and that's, that's not that's anything like, new. You know, it's, it's, it's an, it's, it's another kind of catch 22 in the sense that like, it's 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 not like the, the quote unquote MSOs showed up in New Jersey on January 1st, 2022, right? I mean, like the incumbent industry, like many right. of which were, were among the first five licensed in New Jersey, you know, pre-2016, right? So like it's it's not, you know, it's not like it was this 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 great olive branch over to them. It, it was this recognition, they're the only ones in the marketplace, right? And and you know, and and like Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, it sounds funny, but at the end of the day, like it does come down to democracy, right? Like the voters of New Jersey voted and they said, we want adult use now. The legislature said, hey, look, we want, right. the legislature said, the latest we want adult use sales is February 22nd, 2022, right? The, the CRC did miss that date, but eventually came around and said, you know, this is the incumbent industry, whether we like them or not. And, and you know, by the way, like, Again, going back to that 2019 lawsuit that we've referenced probably 50 times in this podcast already, right? Like, like the industry was supposed to be a lot bigger by this point in time. And like, you know, give those those 12 mm -hmm. ATCs, those incumbent ATCs, a lot of credit. Again, they not only shouldered the marketplace for uh, a patient population that, again, increased from roughly 5,000 patients all the way up to, I think it's 130,000 today. They also built out in anticipation of adult use 
so that they, they could get back to what the voters of New Jersey wanted at the end of the day. So like, again, there's always going to be that tension of, of, right. uh, of, you know, we don't want to give everything to the MSOs, but again, how this system panned out, I mean, as we said, you know, the best case scenario for dispensaries is 2023. What's it going to look like for cultivators who typically need what between one year and 18 months, even to build out in the first instance, like, I, you know, I almost flip that on his head and say, right. like, thank goodness we have the incumbent industry. Otherwise, the citizens of New Jersey would be waiting probably till 2024 to get any product. Right. Absolutely. Like supply and demand. There's so many different things that like we have to take into account for it. And really, I think the um, biggest, the largest goal that we want to go after is access and having more access to the plant. And if that means that the uh, previous operators are the ones that are first to market, so that way we can have more access to the plant, then so be it. That's what it's going to be. And um, like I said, it was not like I, it was completely what I was expecting. I read the regulations. I don't know how many times. So like I knew what that was to happen, but just seeing the, all the posts on LinkedIn just made me chuckle. I'm just like, you guys like, I don't know it's, what you're it's talking just about. Like <laughs> there's, there's always like a couple of like, like pre-selective narratives that everyone just always wants to jump into. But, but to your point, I mean, look, you right. know, I, you know, I, I'm, ex, I'm very excited for New Jersey, right? Because at the end of the day, like all consumers are going to have a choice and, and consumers are going to vote with their dollars, so to speak, on, on what products they like. And, and that's going to influence, that's going to influence the marketplace as a whole, right? And like, that's the best possible thing. And like, yeah. again, I hope from cultivators to manufacturers to dispensaries, these new adult use licenses, I, I sincerely hope that it's before 2023, before 2024. You know, I, again, I just have a, a little bit of um, a little bit of concern, right? I mean, the CRC's head and heart is in the right place in terms of how they set up the licensing structure. Um, but, but I, I just, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to lead to operate new operational licenses in the short term, you know, when, when consumers themselves will, will want it the most. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, before we wrap up the conversation, a, a question I always ask everyone is what are your three wishes for our industry, whether that's in New Jersey, federally, Northeast market, like, yeah, what so, are your thoughts there? Um, you know, it's so funny. I mean, as I was as I was thinking about this, like I think it all comes down to funding and financing, right? And I think we could probably get something between three and ten different options on those wish lists. I think probably safe banking is one of them. Um, I think with the way New Jersey is rolling out, and certainly the way New York is rolling out, I think the importance of of safe banking for these social equity communities, for these diversely owned communities is going to go to the forefront. Like, you know, I know there's been chatter down in DC about wanting to get this safe banking tied to something, um, to a larger kind of packet of legislation. But, you know, I, I think the scariest thing, again, for New York and New Jersey, probably over the next year and a half is, you know, we've, we've pushed social equity applicants and diversely owned applicants to the front of the line. But can they succeed without more robust access to capital? Right. And, and and that's that's, you know, even with the hundred that have already been granted licenses, you know, we see that more and more. I mean, New Jersey and New York are very expensive places to operate. Right. You know, I mean, you know what? Think of cultivation alone. I mean, one stat that's always jumped out to me is in the state of New Jersey, there's less than a three percent vacancy rate for industrial properties. That's statewide. That doesn't even take into account that some of those industrial properties maybe in town, 70% of which have opted out, right? So, so finding property is right. extremely difficult, let alone competing with, you know, 100 other applicants, all fighting for the same properties in the same limited towns with the same limited um, licenses, right? Um, and I think until there's greater access to capital, um, you know, all, all of our discussions on, on priority, um, and and doing things the right way will will kind of be for naught because um, without the ability to 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 fund and finance these licenses they're they're not going to go anywhere and you know and the scarier thing on top of that is you know right. you know to the extent to which we're we're about to enter into a recession right right at this time when folks need need money the most is is likely when it's going to get the tightest so um, so much of it comes down to financing and funding because uh, you know cannabis operations in the Northeast in particular are certainly not cheap. Yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, Mike, thank you so much for this conversation today. How can people get a hold of you? What's your sure, contact, sure. Uh, website, so all that fun Mike stuff? Mike McQueen from Foley Hoag. You can Google me, uh, find me on LinkedIn um, and the like. I'm, I'm sure I'll get some information to Bree. Bree can, can, can blast that as well. Um, but yeah, happy to chat with anyone. You know, my, my day job is, is taking phone calls and working through problems and, and would love to do it with any of your listeners. Awesome. Love it. Well, thank you for taking the time and thank you for all of your wealth of knowledge. This is great. Anyone looking to get licensed in New Jersey, Mike is your guy. Thank you.